goes as May Hobbs, and I am currently a sort of researcher and freelance writer specializing in the history of art and cinema as well as its intersections with philosophy and aesthetics but today i'm talking a little bit about freud and i guess more generally about psychoanalysis um, as a philosophical phenomenon and as a kind of a, a practical phenomenon as a means of treating people and treating mental illness um, which is why i'm going to start with this sort of question of what psychoanalysis, what is psychoanalysis and what does it try to do um because i think this is going to act as a kind of framing device for a lot of what i'm going to be talking about and particularly when i return at the end of um, my talk today to speak about criticisms of freud and particularly contemporary criticisms of freud which are proceeding from either modern neuroscience or modern therapeutic practices i think it's worth um, bearing in mind this idea that psychoanalysis and what Freud is writing about is ultimately intended to treat people and it's intended to treat patients with what we might now um, call sort of neurodivergences or certain kinds of mental illness but which Freud often refers to either as neuroses these kinds of anxieties that afflict different people um, or as perversions the ways in which people's sexual behavior deviates from what for Freud is a very narrow norm um, and the importance of psychoanalysis I suppose historically is that psychoanalysis takes the um, base of the therapeutic practice the most important um, component of, of treatment for patients as the things that patients don't know are going on inside their own mind and this is the idea of the unconscious which um, is sort of, I guess, looms large as Freud's great innovation. The notion that the things that make our minds tick and that also make our minds go wrong are often well below the surface of conscious thought. Um, and so psychoanalysis endeavors through sort of talking therapy to either sort of find out what is going on within a person's unconscious, potentially what is going wrong within a person's unconscious, and also crucially to make the patient themselves more and more aware of the kinds of, the, the, the processes that go on below the level of conscious thought that animate their desires and their fears. Um, and this historically is important both insofar as it starts to think of the human mind in a way much more analogous to the way that modern neuroscience thinks it, even if modern neuroscience has a lot of not so nice things to say about Freud. Freud begins to conceive of the psyche as a partly deterministic structure, in other words, as something which doesn't necessarily do just what you tell it to, and where problems can't just be overcome by force of will or, you know, good moral character, but where there are potentially things going on beneath the surface that we don't seem to have control over and that stem from trauma and childhood and all kinds of developmental history of the patient, which they might not even be aware of. Um, and this acts as, I suppose, a real counterpoint to the scientific backdrop and indeed the philosophical backdrop in which Freud is operating. In many ways, Freud's thought is a rejection of certain enlightenment principles which hold up the, um, the rational mind as something that is sort of sovereign and potentially all powerful. Freud raises instead the contention that maybe what we are able to rationally do with our brains um, and the kinds of you know, solutions we can impose upon rational brains going wrong lie not with the, you know, the mind as it operates when it thinks about sort of hard philosophical or mathematical problems, um, but as it operates in dreams and in moments of terror or sort of adoration. Um, and, so, and so this is, I think, just a few, a, a set of ideas to bear in mind as we go through because they'll crop up again and again, even as Freud's ideas obviously evolve and change. Um, I think this is another thing that I'd just like to sort of caveat before getting into the meat of Freud's theories, um, is that this is very much a body of work, which I don't have time to cover all of, but which um, 
changes substantially as it goes. Freud raises certain theories, entertains other ones, and then sometimes rejects them or completely resuscitates them. And there'll be a few cases of that that we see today. Um, but I think it's important to, I suppose, you know, bear in mind that when I use a new terminology, Freud doesn't necessarily think that sort of one term is interchangeable with another. When he moves, say, from the id, which I'm going to explain, to talking about the life instincts or the sort of eros instincts, this is an important change in his theories and reflects what I think is quite a psychoanalytical structure to his philosophy. Um, in the sense that as, as he talks to patients and talks to himself, and talks to other psychoanalysts, these ideas shift and gain a better, more sophisticated understanding um, of the human psyche and its unconscious. Um, and so these ideas are often coming back time and time again, but aren't fixed and aren't necessarily going to look the same in all the elements of the presentation as I go through it. So what are these major theories? Um, okay. So to begin with, perhaps the most famous, Freud centers much of his philosophy around the notion of the Oedipus complex, this foundational psychological phenomenon by which the child, Freud, and this has been the subject of endless revision and debate, but for Freud, primarily the male child um, undergoes a developmental stage between the ages of three and six, where he develops this strong hatred for the father and a strong sexual desire for his mother. Um, and Freud, in order to sort of explain this phenomenon, refers to the story of Oedipus from Sophocles' Oedipus Rex. Um, and to sort of briefly summarize this, Oedipus is um, sort of destined, foretold by a by a seer that he will kill his father and, and sleep with his mother. And despite sort of being sent away, banished by his father to avoid this fate, Oedipus unknowingly comes back upon his father Laius, kills him and marries his mother Eucasta. Um, and upon discovery of this, gouges out his own eyes. Um, and the myth, the myth is primarily important insofar as it captures for Freud this sort of basically kind of inbuilt and, and, and predetermined system of, of, of child psychosexual development. So for Freud, there are a number of psychosexual stages through which a child goes, beginning with this phase of sort of oral fixation um, between sort of birth and the age of approximately two, and then a period of anal fixation as the child begins to be toilet trained effectively, and then finally moves into this genital stage of development uh, where the Oedipus complex kicks in, in the male child. Um, I think it's worth noting here that Freud's is deeply ambivalent towards the psychosexual development of the female child. First, in early writings, referring to a negative Oedipus, Oedipal complex or a female Oedipus complex um, in which the female child undergoes a, a sort of similar phenomenon, again, where the focus is on killing the father and sleeping with the mother, um, but undergoes this with, uh, as a sort of deepened and, and, and harder psycho psychological experience because of penis envy, the recognition that she, as a as a girl, lacks the penis, which would allow this sort of system to be completed. Um, but Freud doesn't really commit to this idea. And when later his student and um, sort of another very important psychoanalyst, Carl Jung, proposed an electrocomplex, in other words, a sort of an opposite um, experience in the female child of desiring to kill the mother and have sex with her father. Freud rejected this and doubled down on the sort of strict application of the Oedipus complex to the male child. Um, and this has been the subject of a number of critiques um, 
centering both on Freud's sort of lack of desire to grapple with the development of female children, and also because his sole effort to do so revolves entirely around the phallus, this sort of deeply phallocentric theory um, in the criticisms of numerous later sort of feminist scholars and psychoanalysts. And so the importance of the Oedipus complex for Freud is that it is basically a time in which a lot of things can go wrong. And Freud attributes a huge number of um, perversions and neuroses to things going wrong in these early stages of child psychosexual development. Freud attributes different kinds of plights in later life to different stages of development at which something has gone wrong. So for instance, Freud notes the character traits that he thinks are associated with, say, um, a, a, some kind of trauma or arrested development occurring during the oral stage, the stage at which the child is fixated on sort of feeding and biting. Um, and Freud attributes to this sort of problems, including both oral fixation and later life habits of chewing and sucking things, um, but also certain character traits. Um, certain failures to develop fully psychologically. And I think it's worth bearing in mind here that Freud's conception of proper psychological development is incredibly narrow. And this is one of, again, the criticisms that arises again and again of his theories. Freud sees proper development more or less as working through the Oedipus complex, this stage of sort of three or so years. And at the end of this, the male child being able to successfully transfer this desire for his mother to a desire for his female peers. In other words, Freud envisages the only way in which sort of proper psycholog psychological development occurs as entering in with the advent of adulthood to a monogamous heterosexual relationship. And the deviations from this, again, primarily in men, are always attributable to some kind of trauma, usually within this Oedipal psychosexual stage, this stage in which the child realizes that he is unable to kill his father and unable to sexually possess his mother. This is what produces a lot of um, popular conceptions of Freud and indeed is, is, is primary to them and, and not for bad reasons. This is hugely important to Freud's philosophy and crops up again and again. Um, but I think it's important to note that it isn't as simple as sort of Freud being you know, attributing everything in a sort of you know, general sense to sex. Freud attributes very, very specific problems in later life, psychological problems, to specific sort of psychosexual um, traumas in, in the development of the child. And here I think it's important to turn to sort of how Freud conceives of the psyche more broadly. Again, we touch here upon terms which are spoken about an awful lot um, and which I think potentially require a lot of elucidation before they become useful for thinking about the human being. Freud, in his early theory, and again, this is something which he changes later in his work, proposes a division of the human mind into these three parts. One of these, and this, I suppose, is the part of the mind to which we can attribute um, this reading of Freud as kind of sex obsessed, and, and you know, he is, for sure. Um, but this is the it, and the it is, in other terms, this sort of pure kind of primitive desire of the human being. This is the only thing really that's going on in the mind of an infant. The id is hungry, it is lusty, and it doesn't really care about consequences or delayed gratification. The id wants what it wants and it wants it now, and it wants more or less food and sex, and these might be just about the same thing for Freud. Um, because both originate in the sort of the mother's breast, the, the child being breastfed. Um, and so if the infant starts off as, as pure it, as pure desire, untempered by any kind of consideration for moral constraint or prudence or 
waiting to get something better. The development of the infant um, in the second psychosexual stage is the introduction of the ego. Now, the ego is more or less the, the sort of self as we think of it. So if the id is this kind of unconscious drive towards the things that we just can't help but want, this appetite for, for more and more and more, um, the ego is where we begin to see kind of rational self-interest emerge. And so Freud associates this with the toilet training of the, of the child as the first stage at which the child is asked to consider sort of rules and delayed gratification. The child has to start thinking in terms of, sort of what, what it should do now in order to you know, be better off later. Um, and the ego remains the primary province of the conscious mind throughout life. The ego is this sort of the think the thinking brain that works out that we should go to work rather than staying home and having sex and eating a lot of nice food um, because we won't be able to keep doing that. Um, and the ego is also the part of the brain that thinks or you know the part of the psyche that thinks about sort of what it would like to be perceived as it's the social part of the human being um rather than this kind of almost animal appetite um of the it and then finally we have the super ego and the super ego is often reduced um to conscience in popular understandings of Freud which is kind of true um, but as its interpretation in the theory of uh, people like Lacan shows, the superego is, is slightly more complex than this. So the superego, in other words, is sort of what we should do. If, if the id is simply what I want to do right now, and the ego is more or less sort of what I want to do slightly more cannily, the superego starts to impose constraints which don't obviously have anything to do with our immediate appetites or our rational self-interests that have to do with something bigger. So Freud associates in the development of human history the superego with the development of religion, with a kind of extra human or supernatural conscience. But the superego also has to do with the ideal self, um, the kinds of people that we would like to be and the kinds of rules that we impose upon ourselves, the kind of principles um, that we imagine as conducive to the formation of an ideal ego, which is another term that Freud uses almost interchangeably, the superego. Freud grounds this division of the psyche in a book called Totem and Taboo, um, highly criticised on grounds of its anthropological accuracy, which we'll return to, but where Freud proposes to tell the story of, more or less, the beginning of human civilization. Freud begins with what he calls the primal horde, in other words, a sort of semi-mythical first family of humans, or first tribe. Within the primal horde, Freud identifies a primal father. In other words, something like what kind of you know, mistaken popular conceptions might call an alpha male. This sort of male figure of authority who perhaps crucially has access, sexual access to all the women of this tribe. And so the sons of the primal father um, his, his male offspring, in order to attain their sexual access to the, the women around them, overthrow the primal father and, and kill him, in, in, in Freud's telling. And so here we obviously see this tie to the Oedipus myth, the idea that in order to fulfill the demands of the id, these desires that the primal father represses, um, by means of violence and strength. The son kills his father, and since these are the offspring of the women of this primal horde, um, attempt to sexually possess the mother. Um, but what Freud imagines happening after this, or indeed tells us did happen after this, is a stage in which the clan of brothers, in other words, the sons of this primal father, um, 
realize that all they stand to do is perpetuate this cycle, whichever one of them stands in charge, um, th therefore becomes a new primal father and will, in short order, be overthrown by his brothers. And so Freud imagines this clan of brothers um, inventing a sort of totemic primal father. In other words, a figure to do the job that the primal father once had, a job of setting rules, a job of imposing a threat of violence upon the members of the primal horde, um, but without having a real figure there, without having somebody who can be overthrown. And Freud sees this more or less as the dawn of religion, the realization that in order to enforce the rules that allow a civilization or a sort of um, more advanced society to function, we need to invent a kind of totemic father, an authority who we can't just kill when we don't like his constraints. Um, and this, for Freud, is the voice of, of the superego. The constraints that we need for various practical reasons, the, the voice that represses the id, um, but which sits outside and beyond the individual in our conception. This monument erected to the history of a father who threatens his sons with violence if they do not follow certain rules, a kind of social code. And it's for this reason that Freud believes that certain kinds of repression of the id in particular, of its sort of endless hunger and desire, is necessary to establish a civilization. In simpler terms, we might more or less say that sort of you can't have a civilization without people doing various forms of labor, and they aren't going to do various forms of labor if they constantly fulfill their desires to have sex and eat food. Um, and so th this becomes incredibly important for Freud's political reception because there's a latent conservatism for the to the way that freud thinks about human nature and the necessities of repressing parts of its desires um i again don't have time to talk about it now but i think if anybody's interested in in this political side of freud's theory and maybe alternative interpretations of psychoanalytic theory which leave more room for political innovation and for the removal of repression, I'd highly recommend Herbert Marcuse's Eros and Civilization, which directly addresses this question of, sort of how can we how can we have civilization without the kinds of authoritarian repression that the primal father represents or that perhaps God represents in, in later human development. So moving on to another um, deeply influential part of Freud's theory, and indeed to the book that in Freud's lifetime would um, sort of spark interest in him as a figure, we have dreams and their interpretation. For Freud, dreams are this site of privileged access to the human unconscious, a place in which the things that normally are repressed and hidden below the surface of the conscious mind of the ego are allowed to sort of bubble up. He calls this the sort of royal highway to the unconscious. And so the book, The Interpretation of Dreams, is Freud's attempt to reject the previous interpretations of the causes of dreams, um, which often centered either on straightforward ideas about subject. You know, we dream some mixture of things that have happened to us in real life, or that made reference to physical causes um, in our sleep or in our bodies in favor of an understanding of dreams, which focuses on the ways in which they resurrect parts of the unconscious or indeed represent unconscious desires. Um, so for Freud, dreams are places in which we experience or sort of present wish fulfillment, more or less the, the site in which we sort of summon up that which we want or that which we otherwise repress. And for this reason, again, Freud's interpretations of common dreams and the dreams of his patients, which he lists at length, are often to do with sexual desire in all kinds of forms and to do with the Oedipus complex. 
Most intriguingly, Freud talks about a number of sort of typical dreams. In other words, the kinds of dreams that most people have had at some point in their lives, if you ask them. Um, and tries to offer explanations of these which run against the grain of popular conceptions of the time. I think some of what's interesting here is just how influential Freud has been on the way that we think about dreams. I think as I list some of these typical dreams and their interpretations, we might be surprised to find how readily we sort of accept these as commonsensical. There's a book about psychoanalysis written by the philosopher Slavoj Žižek in which he takes an example from the interpretation of dreams um, where a patient comes to Freud and says that he is dreaming about a woman and tells Freud when he begins to sort of press this patient that whoever this woman is and whatever this dream is about, it's certainly not about his mother. And Freud takes this as a sure sign of the dream being about precisely his mother. But Zizek suggests that so influential has Freud and Freudian psychoanalysis analysis been on the popular consciousness, permeating media more plausible to but I'm sure that it's about my mother in some way. Um, but so to list some of these typical dreams, Freud interprets perhaps unsurprisingly dreams where we imagine the death of a relative as always being to do with these basic childhood um, sexual desires and aggressive instincts. So Freud imagines dreams where we imagine the death of a brother or sister as being a reflection of a competitive urge, an urge which says, that the the sibling is always a competitor for resources and for attention and a potential sort of contestant within this clan of brothers for the sexual possession of the mother and therefore these dreams really even if we feel grief within them are about the fulfillment of a wish a jealous aggressive wish to kill off potential competitors um, in the fulfillment of the desires of the it and that if we feel grief in these dreams really this is the imposition of the super ego the part of the mind which imposes upon us that what we really must do is follow certain rules of civilization otherwise we dissolve into a sort of hobbesian mass of, of <laughs> killing and revenge Freud imagines dreams about exams, which I'm sure lots of us are familiar with, and I certainly have on a regular basis, despite sort of having none to sit in the near future, um, as being about the advent of sexual maturity. Freud sees the anxieties that we experience in these dreams as being the anxieties of sexual development and of worrying in in some sense about our own capacities and our own prospects of conducting this seamless and psychologically healthy transition from the id driven instincts of childhood into the sort of adult ego stage the transference from sexual desire from the mother to acceptable desirable sort of peers um, and finally Freud sees dreams of nudity as an almost inverse of these dreams of exams. So the dream in which we sort of suddenly look down and realize that we're naked and we're at school or work or you know in front of our friends and nobody notices is again this kind of wish fulfillment, the, the desire to retreat to the freedom from the guilt and the shame imposed by the superego that we experience in childhood. The childhood where, you know, in, in the sort of Edenic state, we aren't ashamed of our own nakedness and we aren't um, put upon by the demands of conscience and guilt, where we are instead, in many ways, freely under the reign of it, of sort of pure desire. And so when we dream this, even we, if we experience shame, um, the, the wish is to escape from the imposition of shame, the shame about one's nakedness, um, into a kind of childlike state of, of freedom. 
But to complicate matters more, Freud doesn't um, retain the same conception of the human psyche throughout all of his work. Indeed, in Freud's later work, particularly Civilization and its Discontents, Freud decides to um, both sort of simplify and complexify the scheme of id, ego, and superego into the split between life instincts and death instincts. The life instincts can more or less be mapped onto the id. Um, in other words, life instincts equals eros or something like it. These are the desires both to stay alive and to produce life. Um, in, you know, or in other words, sort of eating and having sex, as in the case of the way But indeed, some of what is essential um, in Freud's conception are the death instincts. And the death instincts, but also various kinds of repression and sort of useful destruction, the repression of things which make it difficult to live in society, as we've already mentioned. And from this, we get Freud's idea of the reality principle. In other words, this imposition that we come to terms with as we emerge from childhood into adulthood um, of certain demands which run contrary to our desires, as in the case of the ego or superego, but which we have to observe. And so Freud conceives of not only the life of the individual, but the life of society at large as this kind of war between life instincts and death instincts, creative impulses to have children and to enjoy oneself. In other words, this sort of voice of childhood, um, of, of total creative freedom and desire, competing against forces of repression and aggression, but not necessarily with all the negative connotations which those words might have for us now. The idea is, is that these things are, exist in a necessary and constant tension. Um, and indeed might not be so far apart as, as we think. Indeed, one of the most sort of mysterious and difficult to pin down parts of Freud's thought is that in many ways, the life and death instincts become two sides of the same coin. Freud associates with the death instincts what he calls the nirvana instinct or principle. Um, this desire to essentially retreat to the mother's womb to this state of sort of blissful inactivity and so in the image of the nirvana principle life instincts and death instincts begin to blur at their edges um so the the sort of war between these two might not be as straightforward as as it presented us um which leads us on to criticisms of Freud. And these are many and very common indeed around the turn of the millennium. A huge number of articles were published um, for the sort of 100 year anniversary of um, Freud's interpretations of dreams, saying that more or less we've done away with the need for Freud's ideas. And in many ways, this is true. Modern neuroscience and studies of therapeutic methods have demonstrated that in many cases, um, Freud's ideas simply aren't borne out. They aren't effective for treating people and they aren't likely to um, produce sort of happier, psychologically healthier people um, through psychoanalysis. And neuroscience similarly has cast doubt upon a lot of the causes that Freud attributes. They have resurrected interest in some of the physical reasons why, for instance, we dream what we do and some of the sort of physiological causes of psychological phenomena, the brain chemistry that goes on when we experience depression or what Freud calls melancholia, which seems to cast out on Freud's strictly unconscious driven interpretation. Um, similarly, Freud has come under extensive fire for his anthropological claims, this idea of sort of what happens at the dawn of human history. 
Um, and, you know, I, I think a lot of these have a great deal of merit. It's difficult to, to see how Freud can sort of take seriously his own claims that sort of he knows exactly how human history sort of came to be. But I think there is, of course, another reading that has been taken on by a huge number of contemporary psychoanalysts, which treats this as a myth in its own right, as a series of metaphors which begin to explain human behavior um, from a standpoint of the history of civilization as this sort of microcosmic story of something much bigger and much more diffuse. Finally, Freud has, again, I think quite rightly, come under fire for his misogyny and his hypophobia. Freud's conceptions of the patient and psychological sort of in, you know, object of interest, almost strictly male, and indeed towards the end of his life does away almost entirely with interest in the female patient. His theories of childhood revolve quite strictly around the Oedipus complex and admit little room for speaking about literally half the population. Meanwhile, his conceptions of healthy development in the adult um, revolve around images of heterosexual monogamy and a number of particularly sort of um, Feminist critiques have turned on this as an incredibly narrow and conservative conception of healthy psychological development and have pointed out that a lot of what Freud calls um, perversions are simply you know, developments of otherwise psychologically healthy people. And this has been cast off by a lot of later Freudians and psychoanalysts. Um, and there is, I suppose, also this threat of the conservatism of Freud's explanations of sort of what is necessary for society, the idea that extensive repression is not only a part of society now, but is absolutely necessary to avoid total violence doesn't seem to be borne out by all kinds of societies that we can study throughout history and today. Um, and these are all ideas which are variously picked up on or adjusted in the huge, huge number of psychoanalysts that follow Freud and um, that permeate the ideas of people like Luce Irigaray, Lacan on screen here, and Carl Jung, as well as, um, I suppose, political theorists like Marcuse. I suppose my point to, to depart on is that even if it's relatively easy to dismiss Freud's ideas as being sort of debunked, and, and many of them have been quite convincingly, or sort of politically problematic, and I think there's merit to those claims too, there's clearly a kernel of something about the way that Freud wants to think about the human mind, which is deeply, deeply compelling and has produced a huge amount of interesting post-Freud scholarship. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there and I'm happy to answer any questions.